Welcome to Beat Source Tech. My name is Mojax, and today we are on a journey of nostalgia. Now, before we get started, let me be very clear. I don't think we've ever had it so good as we do today when it comes to DJ technology. The features and functions available to us all, the overall availability and affordability of DJ Kit has never been so good. And I certainly wouldn't want to go back 20 years and have to use the mixers that I used 20 years ago today. No, absolutely not. But on the other hand, I can look at some vintage mixers and look at some features which have kind of fallen out of favor. They're not, you know, in fashion anymore. They don't really appear on any modern kits. And I look at some of those features and I think, yeah, maybe some of those deserve a second chance. I'll reiterate this once more. In so many respects, modern DJ gear is simply superior to older stuff. You can make arguments about the sound of really old kit like Yuri and Bozak mixers if you like, but I remember the days when crossfaders could be dead within a week, shout out to my Gemini 525, and fader curve controls were a real rarity. And it's about practical features too. Of these three mixers, two of them used to cost the equivalent of 600 bucks in today's money, and there is not a single balanced output in sight. Quite simply, if you try and tell me a Pioneer DJM 500 is superior in any way to a DJM 900 Nexus 2, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. So with that said, let's get into my list of things which I miss from vintage mixers. First up, kill switches. For the uninitiated, these are either push buttons or flick switches, which instantly cut the bass, mid or treble on a channel. They aren't a replacement for EQ knobs, as you have no control over the amount they cut by, and you can't boost frequencies. But considering that one of the most popular techniques DJs use when blending is the bass swap, cutting the bass on one track while slamming it in on another, I think kill switches deserve to be given a second look. In the analog era, it was another set of controls with the potential to become noisy over time, but these days they could be part of the digital processing of a device, removing that problem. I think the ideal place for them is right next to the existing EQ knobs, as they are on this new mark, as that opens up the possibility of activating two switches at once with the same hand. Lots of creative potential. Next on my list is rotary conversion kits. Never the most popular feature in the past, I do think there is a bigger market today of DJs who are rotary curious and would love the chance to try out the rotary mixing experience on their existing mixers. Sure, there are boutique manufacturers out there who will knock you up a custom kit for a lot of different mixers, but that's not the same as, for example, when Pioneer offered a kit for the DJM800, or when you could swap in rotaries on a fader by fader basis on Vestax models like the PMC170. I never actually cut on my up faders, so for me, a chance to put rotary controls onto something like a Rain 72 or a DJM S11 would be an absolute dream. It's now been so long since I encountered transform buttons on a mixer, I'm sure there are many younger DJs who won't even know what they are. Basically, it's a button which either punches in or punches out a channel, allowing rhythmical stabs and even quite technical cuts without the need to be so skilled in fader control. Named after the transformer scratch invented by Spinbad and popularized by DJs like Cash Money and Jazzy Jeff, I'm sure most of today's turntablists wouldn't ever make use of it, but there could be potential for the less skilled like myself to get some cool sounds using it and, like Kill switches, it could now be implemented in a digital way, eliminating potential noise. At this point, I'll give an honourable mention to phono line switches when used for cutting. As a functional feature, they still exist on a number of devices, but cutting with them was always and continues to be a pretty challenging thing. So I'd love to see someone revisit the idea that DJ Focus implemented on the Stanton SA8, where he used small, short optical switches above the faders to enable the same techniques, but in a more elegant way. There has to be some potential there if a big manufacturer can see it. 
Next up, lights. Yes, for many years, mixers had ports for gooseneck lamps built right into the top panel. Sometimes they were on a BNC connection like on this Newmark, and sometimes they even used XLR sockets, which always seemed like a pretty dodgy idea to me. Now, with a lot of mixers today, you do kind of have an option for this. If there's a spare USB port on there, LED gooseneck lights which connect to USB are readily available. I got this one for about 6 bucks off Amazon, and it could make all the difference in a dark booth. But that brings me to my point. LED are in everything now and they're very cheap, so why don't modern mixers just light up more? There have been some examples over the years, the Korg Zero mixers from 2007 and more recently the Allen & Heath Zone DB4 which had illuminated knobs. Fundamentally, most DJs work in dark environments and so having illuminated controls is always going to be useful and I want to see more of them. Finally, I want to talk about colour. Yes, some companies dabble with offering different coloured limited editions of products, with Pioneer DJ doing it most often. But it's super rare today to see anything but white markings on a black chassis, and I really don't know why. Looking at just this small example of vintage kit I pulled out of the cupboard for this video, you see just how good a bit of variety can look. People cherish their silver 1200s, and chances are they aren't being used with a matching silver mixer, so you can't tell me that colour matching is a top priority for most DJs. At this point, I'll shout out Allen and Heath again with the Zone 96, and of course big up A-Track for making his version of the Range 70 in this dope silver finish, but I want to see more of this in the market. Why doesn't Pioneer DJ just release a mixer in blue or red and say, that's the colour of this mixer, end of story? People have different taste in aesthetics, sure, but I can't imagine many DJs would avoid buying a product which really serves their needs just because it's the wrong colour, and you could always skin it if you really didn't like the look. And it's worth noting that the A-Track 70 can be spotted from a mile off on a festival stage, and don't companies want that for their products to stand out from the crowd? Let's get some more colour back into DJ gear please. So there you go, my list of features from vintage mixers which I would love to see brought back for 2022. Now your list might look entirely different, you could completely disagree with some of the choices that I've made, or there could be some features which I've just completely overlooked and forgotten about, which you would love to see brought back. So make your voice heard and sound off in the comments down below. Thank you for watching this episode of Beat Source Tech. I do hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please do give the video a like and subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to make sure you don't miss any future videos. I'll see you next time.